Hello everyone, thanks for joining us again today. We're here at the Caribou Public Library. I am Miss Erin, and we are going to be reading for our chapter book story time, The Wonderful Wizard of Oz by L. Frank Baum. We have two chapters today, actually. We're going to be reading 21 and 22. Um, they are quite short, so they can both fit onto one recording. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Chapter 21 is called, The Lion Becomes the king of the beasts. After climbing down from the China Wall, the travelers found themselves in a disagreeable country, full of bogs and marshes and covered with tall, rank grass. It was difficult to walk far without falling into muddy holes, for the grass was so thick that it hid them from sight. However, by carefully picking their way, they got safely along until they reached solid ground. But here, the country seemed wilder than ever, and after a long and tiresome walk through the underbrush, they entered another forest, where the trees were bigger and older than any they had ever seen. This forest is particular and perfectly delightful, declared the lion, looking around him with joy. Never have I seen a more beautiful place. It seems gloomy, said the scarecrow. Not a bit of it, answered the lion. I should like to live here all my life. See how soft and dry how soft the dried leaves are under your feet and how rich and green the moss is that clings to the old trees surely no wild beast could wish a pleasanter home perhaps there are wild beasts in the forest now said dorothy i suppose there are returned the lion but i do not see any of them about they walked through the forest until it became too dark to go any further dorothy and toto and the lion lay down to sleep while the tin woodman and scarecrow kept watch over them as usual when morning came, and they started again. Before they had gone far, they heard a low rumble as of the growling of many wild animals. Toto whimpered a little, but none of the others were frightened, and they kept along the well-trodden path until they came to an opening in the wood, in which were gathered hundreds of beasts of every variety. There were tigers and elephants and bears and wolves, foxes, and all others in the natural history, and for a moment, Dorothy was afraid. But the lion explained that the animals were holding a meeting and that he judged by their snarling and growling that they were in great trouble. As he spoke, several of the beasts caught sight of him and at once the great assemblage hushed as if by magic. The biggest of the tigers came up to the lion and bowed saying, welcome, O king of beasts. You have come in good time to fight our enemy and bring peace to all the animals of the forest once more. What is your trouble? asked the lion quietly. We are all threatened, answered the tiger, by a fierce enemy which has lately come into this forest. It is a most tremendous monster, like a great spider with a body as big as an elephant and legs as long as a tree trunk. It has eight of these long legs and as a monster growls through, as the monster crawls through the forest, he seizes an animal with his leg and drags it to his mouth where he eats it as a spider does a fly. Not one of us is safe while this fierce creature is alive and we have called a meeting to decide how to care for ourselves when you came among us. Hmm. Here's a picture of the animals talking to the lion. The lion thought for a moment. Are there any other lions in this forest? He asked. No, there were some, but the monster has eaten them all. And besides, there were none of them nearly so large and brave as you. If I put an end to your enemy, will you bow down to me and obey me as king of the forest? Inquired the lion. We will do that gladly, <clears throat> returned the tiger. And all the other beasts roared with a mighty roar. We will. Where is this great spider of yours now? Asked the lion. Yonder, among the oak trees, said the tiger, pointing with his forefoot. Take good care of these friends of mine, said the lion, and I will go at once to fight the monster. He bade his comrades goodbye, marched proudly away to do battle with the enemy. The great spider was lying asleep when the lion found him, and it looked so ugly that its, that its foe turned up its nose in disgust. Its legs were quite as long as the tiger had said, and its body covered with coarse black hair. It had a great mouth with a row of sharp teeth, a foot long, but its head was joined to the pudgy body by a neck as slender as a wasp waste. This gave the lion a hint of the best way to attack the creature. 
and as he knew it was easier to fight it asleep than awake, he gave a great spring and landed directly upon the monster's back. Then, with one blow of his heavy paw, all armed with sharp claws, he knocked the spider's head from its body. Jumping down, he watched until the long legs stopped wiggling when he knew it was quite dead. The lion went back to the opening where the beasts of the forest were waiting for him and said proudly, you need fear your enemy no longer. Then the beasts bowed down to the lion as their king and he promised to come back and rule over them as soon as Dorothy was safely on her way to Kansas. <laughs> now, chapter 22, oops, here we are, is called the country of the quadlings. They must be getting close to the castle of Glinda. The four travelers passed through the rest of the forest in safety, and when they came out from its gloom, saw before them a steep hill covered from top to bottom with great pieces of rock. That will be hard to climb, said the scarecrow, but we must get over the hill nonetheless. So he led the way, and the others followed. They had nearly reached the first rock when they heard a rough voice cry out, Keep back! Who are you? asked the scarecrow. Then a head showed itself over the rock, and the same voice said, This hill belongs to us, and we don't allow anyone to come across it. But we must cross it, said the scarecrow. We're going to the country of the quadlings. But you shall not, replied the voice, and there stepped from behind the rock the strangest man the travelers had ever seen. He was quite short and stout, and had a big head, which was flat at the top and supported by a thick neck full of wrinkles. But he had no arms at all, and seeing this, the scarecrow did not fear the so, that so helpless a creature could prevent them from climbing the hill. So he said, I'm sorry not to do as you wish, but we must pass over your hill, whether you like it or not. And he walked boldly forward. As quick as lightning, the man's head shot forward and his neck stretched out until the top of the head, where it was flat, struck the scarecrow in the middle and sent him tumbling over and over down the hill. Almost as quickly as it came, the head went back to the body and the man laughed harshly as he said, it isn't as easy as you think. Take a look at this picture. Here's their flat top of their heads and look, boing, and it hit the scarecrow. <laughs> It isn't as easy as you think. Hmm. A chorus of boisterous laughter came from the other rocks, and Dorothy saw hundreds of the armless hammerheads upon the hillside, one behind every rock. The lion became quite angry at the laughter caused by the scarecrow's mishap, and giving a loud roar that echoed like thunder, he dashed up the hill. Again, a head was shot swiftly out, and the great lion went rolling down the hill as if he'd been struck by a cannonball. Dorothy ran down and helped the scarecrow to his feet, and the lion came up to her, feeling rather bruised and sore, and said, It is useless to fight people with shooting heads. No one can withstand them. What can we do then? she asked. Call the winged monkeys, suggested the tin woodman. You have still the right to command them once more. Very well, she answered, and putting on the golden cap, she uttered the magic words. The monkeys were as prompt as ever, and in a few moments, the entire band stood before her. What are your commands? inquired the king of the monkeys, bowing low. Carry us over the hill to the country of the quadlings, answered the girl. It shall be done, said the king. And at once, the winged monkeys caught the four travelers and Toto up in their arms and flew away with them. As they passed over the hill, the hammerheads yelled with vexation and shot their heads high into the air but they could not reach the winged monkeys, which carried Dorothy and her comrades safely over the hill and set them down in the beautiful country of the quadlings. This is the last time you can summon us, said the leader to Dorothy. So goodbye and good luck to you. Goodbye and thank you very much, returned the girl. And the monkeys rose into the air and were out of sight in a twinkling. The country of the quadlings seemed rich and happy. There was field upon field of ripening grain, with well-paved roads running between and pretty rippling brooks with strong bridges across them. The fences and houses and bridges were all painted bright red, just as they had been painted yellow in the country of the Winkies and blue in the country of the Munchkins. 
The quadlings themselves, who were short and fat, looked chubby and good-natured. Were, they were dressed all in red, which showed bright against the green grass and the yellowing grain. The monkeys had set them down near a farmhouse, and the four travelers walked up to it and knocked at the door. It was opened by the farmer's wife, and when Dorothy asked for something to eat, the woman gave them all a good dinner with three kinds of cake and four kinds of cookies and a bowl of milk for Toto. How far is it to the castle of Glinda? asked the child. It is not a great way, answered the farmer's wife. Take the road to the south and you will soon reach it. Thanking the good woman, they started afresh and walked by the fields and across the pretty bridges until they saw before them a very beautiful castle. Before the gates were three young girls dressed in handsome red uniforms, trimmed with gold braid. And as Dorothy approached one of them, she said to her, Why have you come to the South Country? To see the good witch who rules here, she answered. Will you take me to her? Let me have your name and I will ask Glinda if she will receive you. They told who they were, and the girl soldier went into the castle. After a few moments, she came back to say that Dorothy and the others were to be admitted at once. Here is our last picture for today. There are the three girls in red. Well, thank you for joining us again today, and we will see you next time when we continue on in Chapter 23. We are nearing the end, you guys. <laughs> Have a great rest of your day. We'll see you then. Bye for now.